lavish or not, a ball boy. Like we heard Kenyon all Hooker. summer long that this team is going to look all different, all sorts of different, all this mess. And then what we got, we got the same old Titans we going. That's gummit. Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, director of published content here at BroadwaySportsMedia.com. We're also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network. You can follow me on social media at Easton Freeze. I'm joined, as always, by producer JT, who you can follow on social media at JT underscore Runky. JT, happy Wednesday. How are you? Happy Wednesday on the day of recording, Tuesday. Um, and seeing already... The overreactions to week one are coming in hot in our uh, live stream chat here. Like the duality of man is coming in. And then always you have you have like Music City Malik saying, what up, people? Tough game, tough game coming up for the Titans. Hopefully they can turn it around. And then Alex Titan saying Titans will do what they always do. They are who they are. Beyond measure. And then you have the completely insane belongs in in a uh oh what's the uh, insane asylum insane asylum from there dorito lover who says jags run the south clearly so i'm glad right. we are off to a great start in the middle of this overreaction week one uh kind of time period that we are in yeah the takes are flying and that's what today's episode is centered around it is primarily today going to be the hot read heat index overreaction week one edition so super excited to get into that talk about um a number of takes primarily with the Titans and then some things from the AFC South and then things that we thought were noteworthy from the rest of the NFL from week one, some, some popular takes that are flying around. We're going to be the judges and we would love for those of you that are joining us live to help us out being the jury in the the comment section of today's live stream. So, Hey, do me a favor. If you are watching with us live, first of all, thank you. Do me a favor and like retweet, uh, share this, this link with, with a buddy, whatever you can do to help us get as many eyeballs on today's show as possible would be considered a personal favor. And then if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, rather head on over to the Broadway sports media's YouTube page. That's where you're going to find this live stream and the comment section there is where you will be you will be able to comment on today's show and we'll be able to see it on our end and we'd love to talk with you like a number of you already are music scene Malik, Alex Titan, Dorito Lover, Joey Turner, Robert Greenlaw, no thanks. Uh yeah, appreciate I don't know what no what is no thanks in regard to Robert. Uh, I, I don't well, I, I think it's because you were asking them to retweet the show. I, oh. I don't think Robert is going to do that. Okay. So. Well I mean I, I had to ask but you you're up you will <laughs> it's a free country. Do what you want. Um <laughs> Before we get into today's conversation, going into the Hot Read Heat Index, want to give a shout out to our wonderful and fantastic sponsor, Boom Boss Pizza here in Middle Tennessee. They've got three Middle Tennessee locations in Spring Hill, East Nashville, and Murfreesboro. So if you are in the Middle Tennessee area at all, there is a location within driving distance of you. We are doing our Thursday live shows live from Boom Boss in Spring Hill each and every Thursday night this season all the way through to the Super Bowl. Every single week before Thursday Night Football, we will be live at Boom Boss in Spring Hill doing our show there just before kickoff. Um, and, and we love Boom Boss Pizza. They have some of the best pizza, I would argue, in the world. And that's not an outrageous claim based on the fact that they are a four-time winner at the International Pizza Expo in Las Vegas. And the only pizza company, I believe, in the entire world that has won Best New Pizza in America, well, I guess in America, because it's in America, right? Not in the world. Fair. <laughs> but in America, they are the only company to have won Best New Pizza in America twice before at the International Pizza Championship. So Boomba's Pizza has some of the best pizza you will ever taste. They've got some pizzas you definitely have never tried before. It's not just that they've perfected the pepperoni pizza. No, no. They have fantastic vegetarian and gourmet and international and non-traditional pizza options that, you know, you, you got to trust the chef on. I'm not a huge... I'm typically... JT, I'm one of those guys that I'm not a picky eater per se, but when I go to a restaurant, like when I go to a Mexican restaurant, I typically order safe. You know, give me a taco, give me a quesadilla, whatever. I'm not I'm not going crazy with my order. Give me something I know I'm going to like. Um, you're not, got, you're not got, a fan got, of the sizzling fajitas? I mean, I am. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but like I typically, when I have a spot, I've got my order at that spot. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, a yeah. creature of habit. Um, so I'm not typically trying new things, but at Boomba's, I've had the opportunity to try some things there that I've never had. And it's, I, I'm yet to try a single thing from this restaurant that I did not like. 
Um, it's really fantastic food. So check out Boomba's Pizza if you are in the Middle Tennessee area. And check out our live show. We'd love to hang out with you and watch Thursday Night Football every single week at Boomba's in Spring Hill. If you want to swing by, grab a bite, grab a drink, hang out and watch some football. One more thing before we get into today's topic. If you are not subscribed to Broadway Sports Media on YouTube, do me a huge favor and hit that subscribe button right now. Trying to drive up that subscriber count. Um, I know we, we see the views. We see the metrics. There are more of you that watch and are not subscribed than those of you that watch and are subscribed. So I think a lot of you just, you know, you don't realize, you know, sometimes JT, you ever had a, a channel that you just love and you are a, a big consumer of. And then one day you realize I've been watching these guys for like a year. I'm not even subscribed to this channel. Like the algorithm is just feeding me. I need to subscribe. So if that's you hit the subscribe button, do us a favor. Um, it, it costs you nothing. It's free to hit that button and it helps us out. So do that real quick for us. And now finally we can get into the warm up today. And JT, I wanted to, in today's warm up, talk one final time, give a final word on the week one officiating, not here to beat a dead horse. This is, this is, I just, I want to give an overview on my thoughts on the situation, but more importantly, I want to talk about what I think is the right way to complain about refereeing in the NFL. And there's a way that people complain about refs that I think is, is, is contrite and overdone and, and lame. And there's a way that people don't typically complain about refs that they should do more in my opinion. So before I, before I talk about that opinion of mine, I, I want to address, you know, obviously the, the talk of officiating from game one for the Titans was the clearly fumbled ball out of Derek Carr's hand on the Arden key strip sack fumble recovered by Kevin Byard run back for a touchdown. And then the referees not only blow the run back and ball on the play dead, they then go to review the play after Mike Rabel challenges the call and they decide not only were they right to blow the, the play dead, but it was an incomplete pass. It was not a fumbled ball where clearly on the, the pull back of the motion, Derek Carr loses control of the ball and the ball is propelled forward only by a fist or side of hand. There was no control of the ball by Derek Carr on the follow through, which is what is required for it to be an incomplete pass. If the, if the passer has control of the ball coming forward, it's incomplete. If they don't, it's a fumble. And clearly it was a fumble that was propelled forward by Derek Carr's hand recovered by Kevin Byard. And so not only did they very foolishly and inexplicably blow the play dead early, which again is refereeing 101. They are taught, they are instructed as NFL referees. When in doubt in these situations, you let the play play through you, you let it you let it happen you let it play out so that you can easily then because say it was an incomplete pass jt well, well what have what would have been the harm of letting that play play out kevin byard runs the ball back it's ruled a touchdown you review the play turns out it's an incomplete pass no harm no foul you bring it back it's saints ball again to kick their field goal everything is right in the universe when you blow the ball dead you blow the play dead potentially steals points and or possession and or return yardage from the, the defensive team that made the play. And that's what happened to the Titans. And then the referees doubled down and Dean Blandino an NFL uh, rules official that if, if you've paid attention to the NFL at all, you're familiar with Dean and his work. He uh, does some work with the 33rd team. Now a, a newer publication in the NFL media space. He did a video yesterday, breaking down the specifics of this play what happened, what the ruling was, and then gave his opinion on, on why it was a, a really bad call and an incorrect call. And, and I, I put out a, a thread, a tweet, and that, that is what I want to, to talk about here about how this was not a horribly incorrect call. Like JT, we, we have seen more times than any football fan can count referees just making the wrong call, a matter of human error, a matter of them maybe just being bad at their job or in a moment making a a horrendous mistake, but there's reason to believe that. Yeah, they really believe what they're saying. They just, they, they messed up. They got it wrong. That's not what happened here. Um, what happened here was really simple to me. The refs effed up and, and they knew that they effed up, right? They blew the play dead prematurely, inexplicably. Can't tell you why, but they did. And they effed up and they realized it in that moment. They went to review the play upon Mike Vrabel's challenge and clearly realized because they're not blind, they're not dumb. They realized they messed up not only by blowing the, the, the ball dead early, but by calling it an incomplete pass because clearly on the replay in slow motion, it's not, I mean, there's just no argument. It is by the book definitionally a fumble, not an incomplete pass. 
And so they realized they were wrong on both the counts, but they did not care. They, they didn't. They kept the ruling on the field as called because to reverse the ruling would be an admission of taking away a Titans touchdown. And they simply would not make that admission and or assume such major fault in the course of the game. And so they doubled down. They doubled down on their wrongness in, in a sad and and very uh, easy, easily seen through attempt to save face here. And Mike Vrabel really kind of alluded to it when we asked him about this in his press conference on Monday when we talked about this play in particular. And he said, and I would give you the quote verbatim, but essentially paraphrasing, he said, they're never going to call that back. When they've blown the ball dead, That the ruling on the field is going to stand no matter how blatantly obvious it is upon replay. They're never going to call that back because they're not going to undermine their own authority, the referees, in admitting their mistake there. And so th this was not an incomplete call or an incorrect call, rather. It was a lie. It was a bold-faced lie. Uh, and that, that's what happened here. And, and you, you should, as fans, be really upset about that. Now, a number of Saints fans responded, replied to that tweet of mine saying, one in particular said, as a longtime Saints fan, we are often told to get over it when stuff like this happens. And I think back to the Saints getting absolutely screwed out of a Super Bowl berth. Just a couple of seasons ago, the NFC Championship game against the Jared Goff Rams was at 2017, the 2016-17 year. The, the obvious blatant pass interference call that was such a massive story that for one season we decided pass interference was going to be reviewable. And then that was a nightmare. So we undid that. But the Saints have gotten their fair share of all time screw jobs on officiating. So, like, I get it. I sympathize. I really do. And, and, and this this Saints fan said, we're told to get over it when this stuff happens and that I offer you the same advice. Get over it. And my response to that is simply the Titans are responsible for losing this game. I feel like I was pretty clear about that online. I feel like I was pretty clear about that on Monday's episode of the hot read podcast. The, the Titans are at fault. Like they, they, as, as much as the, the saints or the, the referees screwed them over in this game, it is the Titans fault for having lost that game. I don't think anybody can really argue that also d divorced from that separate from that. The referees made an unforgivable mistake here. They told a bold-faced lie, and they were solely responsible for a 10-point swing. Both things can be, and in this case, I think very clearly are true. And so I, I, that, that brings me to my, my second point in that I think people are too often blaming referees for losses. Like, like I said on Monday's show, nobody likes blame the ref guy. Nobody does because, you know, it's every team – in in the history of the NFL and for the foreseeable future of the history of the NFL will be regularly screwed over by calls. It happens. There's human error involved. So nobody likes blaming the refs because it's, it's an out. It's a cop, right? It's, it's, it's a lame excuse, but what isn't done enough in my opinion is what I'm trying to do here and trying to, to, to make, you can divorce the two things of, Hey, you, your team cost itself the game. Like your team should have won the game. Very, very rarely can you point to the ref single-handedly losing a game for a team. In fact, in the NFL, I'd argue you never can unless it's truly just like a they were paid off. Like it's a correct, like an un, un before never before seen situation where referees were truly paid off. I, I, I don't think it's ever been the case that the referees actually cost a team a game more than the team cost themselves a game. But you should be relentlessly ripping into refs whenever they do a horrendous job. Like you can just... You can just complain about rip into clown referees, demand, demand change, demand better, demand consequences for referees when they do a really, really bad job. That's completely fair. And so if you make clear that, hey, I don't think that they cost my team the game. I do think that they did a horrible job. That's something that we should do more of and that that distinction should be made. Um do one person commented and the, the last thing I want to say on this one person said that things like this play were the reason that most people swear that the league is rigged. I'm not so sure myself rigged is a step too far. Like I don't, I'm not sitting here trying, I'm saying the referees lied here. I don't want to, I want to make it clear. I'm not implying that, that the refs were bought off and any, like it's not, it's, it's not that deep. It's not a conspiracy. This is not a tinfoil hats moment. There, there was th that implies implies forethought, right? If it's rigged, um, the refs didn't come into this game planning to screw the Titans or make calls slanted towards the saints. N none of that. It's not happening in the NFL. It's the, it's like the distinction between first and second degree murder, you know, like first degree murder, you plant. No, really like you, you planned it out. Like it's premeditated, right? They're responsible for second degree, bad refereeing where it was in a moment of passion in a fit of rage. They made a mistake. 
and, and and it cost this team. It wasn't it wasn't a premeditated hit on one team in particular. It just happened, and it cost one team greatly. And they are they are guilty of that in a, in a big way. So, whenever there's bad refereeing in the NFL, no, it's not a it's not a rig job. Nobody's bought off, but it is second degree bad officiating in the sense that they made a really bad mistake, and here they decided to double down on it, and it was ridiculous. So you should rip refs more often, not for costing you games, but for being really bad at their jobs and, and demanding better for them. All right, that is the uh, the warm up for us today. And JT, I've seen the comment section going crazy. Have no idea what it's what it's been saying. If it has anything to do with the refereeing situation, are are all of these guys talking about our takes for today, or is there anything that we need to address before we move on to the uh, hot? Reading? I mean, it, the, it is on the refing uh, okay. situation, which we can move on. I just think there are some points like it was very cathartic to see the Titans and um, Saints kind of. Mis mishap right there play out where they blew the whistle and then as Dorito lover points out the refing in the Jaguars game was equally as bad because I mean the Colts punching that ball out even though like everyone was kind of standing around didn't know what happened and then that ends up just gifting the Colts a touchdown like but the refs in that game did the right thing they let the, they, did, they let it play yeah. out that's what you're supposed to do so I, um, like and and those two things happened what maybe 20 minutes apart from each other like they they were they were the juxtaposition there was a little bit on the nose, how similar those things were and how close in time they were to each other. And it just made for a more frustrating experience. And then finally, Alex Titan says, crazy to think how different the game plays out if they get that call right. Probably see a lot more Henry and a lot less Tannehill mistakes playing with a lead. I would tend to agree on that because it was a massive swing in points uh, to the other team. So, I mean, yeah, but... Like you said, there was hey, so maybe much more. Ryan Tanhill shouldn't throw three interceptions. Yes. Like that's where, you know, that's <laughs> also, where you then realize, yeah, okay. So help, the, right? the Titans did lose the game. Yeah. That's how that yeah, works. But we can move on now. All right, let's do it. It's time for the hot read heat index week one overreactions edition. JT, we have listed pre-show a number of popular takes that I have seen floating around the internet, floating around the sewers of Twitter of X, whatever you want to call it. Um, things or, you know, a handful of things that maybe I think we should just talk about some, some topics that I think are pertinent to the Titans after their week one game, a couple of things from the AFC South, and then a handful of league wide topics that I want to discuss. Those of you in the comments, we would love for you to participate here. Not only would I love for you to, again, if you're not on probably sports media's YouTube page right now on the live stream of the show, when you're watching live, go there, leave whatever stream you're watching. Broadway Sports Media on YouTube. The comment section there is where you can play along with us. But we're going to give a rating. And those unfamiliar with the Hot Read Heat Index, here's how it works. Very simple. It's a heat index on the, the hotness of the take, right? So to clarify, it is a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the hottest, 1 being the coldest, right? And, and, and these are not, it's not a true-false scale. It is It is the... It is the boldness of the take that, it, that this, the heat index is grading. So you can have a an 8 out of 10 hot take that I, I might argue I, it's it's hot. It's a bold take. And I agree with it. I think it's right. And, and you can have a pretty common take, something that the masses are saying might be a 2. Not a very hot take. Very common. And I think it's whack. I think it's crazy. So those are the, that's the distinction. We are grading the heat index, how hot this take is, how bold a take it is. But then also determining whether we think it's an accurate take or not. And so we'd love, as we are going to play judge today, those of you in the comments, play the jury, give us your thoughts on each of these takes. And then if you've got any overreaction takes from week one of any kind in the NFL that you would love to contribute to the, the show today, we'd love to have those. JT is going to be monitoring the comments, can flag those. And then, then at the end of our uh, pre, pre-planned pre takes here, we, we can talk about the takes that you contribute to today's show. All right, JT. Would you do me a favor and kind of take over hosting responsibilities here? Lead us through. Let's start with the Titans overreaction week one takes first. Yeah, and we have a multitude of these to get into, but the guy with the most takes this week has to be Ryan Tannehill. Ryan Tannehill has been a hot right. commodity this week, but the first take I'm going to give you is that the Titans should bench Ryan Tannehill now. Yeah. And on, on our rundown, I just, I wrote Ryan Tannehill in all caps as this take, because I was trying to find a way to encapsulate all the Ryan Tannehill takes into one, but there's so many flying. We've got like three or four. We're going to address the, the sub takes on the Ryan Tannehill genre here. So the first, like you said, bench Ryan Tannehill. Now the hot read heat index on this take is it's a nine. 
it's it's a it's a flaming hot take. It's it's very reactionary. It's very much an overreaction, and it's a bad take. It's it's dumb. Um, what would benching Ryan Tannehill now accomplish for you, JT? If you're thinking about this team, either in the short term, the what can we accomplish this season, and or looking at the long term future of this team. So Ryan Tannehill was under contract for a large sum of money through this season. The Titans are paying him for his services, and they did not get their money's worth on Sunday in week one, obviously. But I, I want to first address folks that are talking about Ryan Tannehill after this game. And it's so it's so predictable, but it's so dumb. It's so it's it's reactionary nonsense. It's I've got the blinders on. It's it's peak fan brain. USDA 100 percent beef fan brain. It is meathead stuff to, to talk about Ryan Tannehill after this game. Like he is this this losing loser quarterback that sucks and and has has sucked and will always suck. And what you saw on Sunday is reflective of what Ryan Tannehill is. Okay, Ryan Tannehill has a pretty comfortable by a pretty comfortable margin, large winning record as a Tennessee Titan. He has won far more games for you as a Titan than he has lost. And I, I think the maybe the more fair way of talking about him and the way he's been talked about in the past. Again, it's negative, but it's it's more accurate. Ryan Tannehill, very good regular season quarterback. He stinks in the playoffs. Okay, that that you you that's more on base. I think you can have that conversation about stinking in the playoffs and sample size and all of that. But that's how he's been talked about in the past. And then he comes into week one this year, his first game since I think week 14, 15 last year, because people forget he was placed on IR to end the season um, with that that tightrope ankle surgery that he needed with with the sprained ankle, the broken ankle. He's not played. And then in the, in the in the preseason, he hands the ball off three times in the third game. That's the extent of his playing time. It, it's it's not crazy that he was bad in this game. The explanation and, and we asked Mike Vrabel on Monday what the explanation for it was. And it was it was for him after having a, a chance to watch the tape. Simply, I don't know. He had a bad game. Like explain away Josh Allen's bad game. Explain away Joe Burrow's bad game from this week. It's just guys have bad games. You know, you have a bad day at the office. That's that's what Ryan Tannehill had. He was he was bad in this game. Is it reflective of what he is as a quarterback, though? Almost certainly not. Like there is a in in the realm of possibilities, he's just washed, and this is who he is now. That's technically there's a universe in which that is where we that may be the universe, the timeline that we're on. But almost certainly the case here is that it was an outlier performance, considering, like we talked about on Monday's show, it was statistically speaking, the worst game of his career, that makes it the most outlier than it can be, right? Like if Ryan Tannehill comes in to week two, Nissan Stadium hosting the Chargers this week, throws for 380 yards, four touchdowns, and has 30 rushing yards and has 119.4 QB rating. That's also an outlier performance. Uh, no one's going to then turn around, rightfully so, and be like, Ryan Tannehill, that's who this quarterback is. No, they're outlier performances. You got to take the median of the sample size. And the median of the sample size for Ryan Tannehill is he's a great trailer quarterback, but he's not a tractor. He's not pulling the team. You hitch, he, you hitch the Ryan Tannehill wagon to your squad and hope that the squad is good enough to pull a Ryan Tannehill. He's not going to ruin things for you. You can win with him, but you're not going to win because of him. And that's, that's what he is. And so the idea that you should bench Ryan Tannehill now, again, what does it accomplish now this season? Nothing. You, you are not winning more games with Malik Willis. You are not winning more games with Will Levis. I, like I can, I'm just telling you the team thinks so the coaches think so the front office thinks so a guy in me and anybody else in the media group that has, that has watched all three of these quarterbacks for the past six weeks will tell you definitively that's not happening. And so that's not accomplishing anything this season, unless you're trying to tank. And then if you're trying to tank, the argument is, um, this team's not bad enough to tank with any of the three quarterbacks. Like, did you see what this defense was capable of in that game with the defensive front is capable of? Have you noticed how everyone's talking about the offense in the sense that like, well, you know, kind of everything else worked. Ryan Tannehill just had a really bad game. Well, if the rest of the supporting squad on offense was really nice and we're going to get to some more of this in the future, but you know, the offensive line played better than we thought. Hey, Chig and, and Traylon Burks and, and DeAndre Hopkins, they were getting open. Tannehill just couldn't hit them. 
how, you can't be bad if the rest of the team is good. That You can't tank. Mike Vrabel, does that guy strike you as somebody that's going to tank? It's not happening. So, yeah, it's, it's a crazy take. It's nine on the hot read, uh, heat index scale, and it, it's bad. It's not, it's not correct. And then we have two others here, which I think basically just – compliment what you just said so we'll right. just like in just rate them and then we'll move on but the first one Tannehill has a short leash how would you rate that one yeah that i wanted to talk about this one in particular i'd give it on the heat index i would give it not not quite as hot as benching him now i'd say it's a seven and a half and the reason why is because folks are talking about how you know you don't bench Tannehill now obviously it's just week one but you know i he may only, you know, two or three games in, if he's still not pulling his weight, you could see him benched. They could be 0-3 and, and he gets sat down. I just, I don't, setting aside whether I think it's the right idea or not, just as a prognosticator of evaluating this team, the coaches, what what they're thinking, what's going through their head on this topic, it's not happening. The very, very earliest that I, and, and I say not happening, that is assuming again that the week one was a, an outlier performance. If he throws nine interceptions and zero touchdowns through three games, not only is that an all-time five-alarm fire, worst three-game stretch for a starting-level quarterback that we've seen maybe ever, and like historically relevant in the NFL, like it'd be crazy for that to happen. Then that's a different story, right? Where I'm assuming here that he's that what we saw on Sunday was the the floor for the near future for Ryan Tannehill. It may not get good, but it's not going to be worse than that, right? It, it may it may just be fine. That being said, assuming it's not a an all time historic disaster, the earliest that I can see them considering benching him is after the bye. They play Baltimore in week six in London. They have the bye in week seven. Maybe coming out of the bye into week eight is is when if they are one and five, zero oh and six, they maybe start to think about that. But as I talked about a little bit in the the hot read take purge uh, a couple of episodes ago now. And I said it half jokingly in that episode, but I kind of believe it. I'm more inclined to think that this team, this coaching staff, this front office is going to hang on to Tannehill as the starter longer. If, if things go south, they're going to hang on to him as the starter longer than fans want them to. And the reason behind that is, again, he's the guy that gives you the best chance to win. And yes, maybe for the first month of this season, all indications based on the performance on the field, the outcome on the wins and losses column, points to you know they're not going to win you got to change your tack zoom out think about what this team has been doing what they've been telegraphing to you their intentions are based on their movements based on their decisions based on their transactions based on their drafting for the past 6 months since Rand Carthen or 5 months however long it's been since Rand Carthen has been the GM of this team and it's been Rand and Mike running the show everything they've done has indicated that they are trying to win now not touching the contract of Ryan Tannehill or Derrick Henry, but certainly not moving either of them. Signing guys like Jeffrey Simmons, keeping the defense intact, bringing in a DeAndre Hopkins in free agency, drafting for now, but also for the future, a good deal as well. Like everything, as we've talked about on this show for months, they're trying to win now. They're not going to throw away months and months of planning based on one bad month or or two of the start of the season, especially, like I said, in the take purge, when you look at the back two thirds of this team's schedule, it's red meat, man. There's a lot of winnable games there. And even if they are, Owen, I mean, Owen six is like the all time bad, right? That'd be the, that'd be, a, I think a unique scenario, but if they're two and four, one and five, they're going to look at the back half of that schedule and say, we could win nine of 10 here. We really think that we could, we're not giving up on this team and we're not giving up on Ryan Tannehill. So I don't think he has a short leash. I think the shortest you could conceivably see it being is six weeks. But even then, I think that's a stretch. Yeah. And then one more here, which I, this one I came across and just had to throw in here because, okay. oh boy, this was a, uh, this, this one is kind of insane. And I, I think it might break the index here, but okay. trade Ryan Tannehill to the New York Jets. Mm, and very by, popular and based on by, last night's outcome. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and by proxy, uh -huh. uh, someone in the chat here saying, do that and then bring Carson Wentz to Tennessee once, oh once you do that. That picture Great of Carson one. Wentz with the what the Eagles helmet, the Commanders jersey, and the uh, the Colts pants or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, one person a combination wants to add a, yeah. add a a Tennessee Titans sleeve. Is that what he wants to add to I the ensemble so. for yeah. Carson Wentz? Yeah, uh, that I mean that's that's a hundred on the scale. That's that's not that had to be a joke. It's not a joke. You see a mental professional. Um, <laughs> as for trading Tannehill to the Jets, 
it's not a crazy thought based on Aaron Rodgers dying last night. When we talk about league wide overreactions in a little bit in the show, we're going to talk about the Jets and Aaron Rodgers. Very, I mean, like I saw some people clowning this, and I guess if you have a particular hatred for Rodgers or the Jets, I can kind of get it. But as an NFL fan, I I hate all injuries to quarterbacks, no matter the quarterback, because it makes our like the product, the viewing experience worse like i like to watch the best possible football overall like yeah you're rooting for your team whatever but but bad football sucks to watch who wants to watch these backups play i don't who wants to watch zach wilson for the next 17 weeks i don't think anybody wants to do that so i i I don't i don't get relishing an injury like that and especially when it's such a deflating moment for a cursed franchise okay i'm we'll talk about that later but yeah Tannehill to the jets i i i there's probably going to be a phone call there. Like I, the jets are going to, you know, they're going to work the phones. They're, they're going to check in on all their potential options from the jets perspective. I kind of get it. Like he'd be on the higher end of guys you could potentially bring in to, to fill in. Um, but on, on the Titan side of things, again, it, it goes along with their faith in him and unwillingness to move on so quickly and be so reactionary. It, it's not happening. There may be a phone call there, but it's not, it, it's not serious. I, I give that a, I give that an eight on the hot read. He, I, I give it a nine. It's a, it's a nine take. It's a, a very hot take, and it's not it's not an accurate one. Let's move on to a different position here uh, on the Tennessee Titans here. In wait, no, I have one more. Did you? you have I one listed more? one oh, more. Did you see okay. it? Yeah. I oh, yeah, I okay. see it here. Okay. I added it because this is the last one. The last one as well. here. Tannehill is washed. Right, and not to beat the Tannehill horse forever, but this is the last element of Ryan Tannehill from week one that I want to talk about. I I. I don't, Zach, in in the comments. The good news is TVs have multiple ways to avoid watching the games with bad quarterback play. Yeah, I mean, yes, you can always go to different. I just like as much good quarterback play as possible, personally. But, um, yeah, this is something that has been talked about, and I think Zach may have mentioned, maybe it was Zach, maybe it was Braden on their show. I've heard talked about a couple of times so far this week, whether or not, we think Ryan Tannehill's performance in week one was indicative of what he is now. And in particular, the most concerning thing for me, I got a chance this morning to go back and finally watch some of the coaching tape. Um, Didn't really do a deep dive. Just kind of did a rewatch from those perspectives of the game. The thing that I was left with, and I've seen people say this and I agree, the most concerning element of Tannehill's play from this game was that he looked old. He did not the whole game. And there were, there were still flashes of athleticism from him, but it was the oldest in in a, a full game sample size that he has looked to me at any point in his career as a Titan. And it's really the first time as a Titan that I've watched him play and more than once thought like, Oh, that looked, that looked kind of elderly. That looked That didn't look spry. That didn't look like the Ryan Tannehill. We know a sneaky athletic, sneaky mobile quarterback in the NFL. And he's what he's 35 years old. I mean, he's getting up there. So it's not crazy to assume he's eventually going to reach a physical cliff of some kind and that decline is coming if not already here but as for like the decision making the processing understanding the scheme comfortability behind the offensive line and like the seeing ghosts that he was doing a lot a lot of people talking about like he wasn't mobile enough in the pocket I don't know I'd kind of argue maybe he was too mobile in the pocket especially in the first quarter he was bailing from a number of clean pockets early and and it felt like he was just uncomfortable and rattled back there For some reason, I don't know if it was a like battered quarterback syndrome after last season when he truly had to just be paranoid at every second in the pocket and assume he's going to get killed from every angle at any moment. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it's, again, comfortability with the reads in, in the in the system. I don't know. But whatever it was, there was certainly some some ghost watching going on back there from Ryan Tannehill. And that was concerning to see. But the most concerning part, again, was that the, the movement, the the physical ability it started to look old and that that is that is concerning because if if he is starting to get old if he's lost a step physically there is no fixing that you can get more comfortable in the system you can do a better job with your decision making you can be more stable in the pocket you can't reverse father time and so as for Tannehill being washed is he washed mentally is he washed in general I, I think that's a very big overreaction but in terms of physically is he maybe starting to become a little washed I'd give this a five, like maybe a little bit more lukewarm of of a of a hot read heat index rating here, because I do think that's the number one thing I'm going to be watching for on Sunday. How does he look physically? Does he look old again? And if so, 
in what ways and, and do they actively impact his performance in the game? Because that that's a concerning development. Yeah. And then we can now move on to there another position group here. I had a lot uh, to say on Ryan Tannehill. Sorry, you did, sorry you for did. all that. But um, you know what? It's the most important position. He's the hottest topic. That is true. We have got to do this it. This is true. Um, next take here. The offensive line is fixed. Hooray. No more worries about the offensive line because of their play on Saints or play on Sunday against the Saints. We can just sign seal delivered. Don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah, let's slow our roll on that. The, 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 the offensive line is fixed. I, I do want to talk about, I'll give it a rating here at the top. The hot read heat index rating on the offensive line being fixed. I'll give it a like 5.56. I think it's a little hotter than lukewarm, but it's not crazy talk. And it's not crazy talk because when you look at the numbers and speaking, it's speaking of Zach Lyons, our buddy Zach Lyons does a lot of good work on social media, pulling a lot of these numbers. Um, he had a tweet earlier today where he was reiterating the Titans offensive line performance from week one. Statistically sacks allowed two league average was 1.4. So they above average in, in the sacks that they allowed against Ryan or on Ryan Tannehill quarterback hits allowed three and I felt average 2.1. It's not trending well in terms of league average so far, but then you get into quarterback hurries allowed. They allowed seven league average was 7.8. So better than league average on the hurries allowed. Um, right at league average with total pressures allowed 12 total pressures allowed 11.4 was the average. And then their pass blocking snaps. They had 40 of those and the league average was 38.75. So not a matter of, you know, lack of sample size here either. They were pass blocking a lot and they did a pretty decent job. I saw, um, and I'm going to try to pull up these numbers, JT, but I may have you go find them for me real quick. ESPN came out with their offensive line. Um, grades today for again from week one, one game sample size can't overreact to it. But y you saw, um, I, I think I saw that they were the 11th ranked offensive line in the league, according to I don't know if it was PFF, I think the PFF grading they were the 11th team in the league, which is certainly higher than they've been all of last year. I don't know when the last time they were that high in the rankings, and then in the uh, ESPN rankings, it was broken down further. But th they had them ranked around top 10 in the top 10 in a, in a couple of different categories. They, they were highly graded. They got high marks for their week one performance. Certainly well above. There's a fly just annoying the fool out of me right now. Uh, certainly high above the watermark that was expected for this group coming in. Because this team, no matter what outlet, evaluator, algorithm you looked at coming into the season, they were the 32nd out of 32 offensive line this year. In week one, they were far from the worst. In fact, they were above average, according to pretty much anything you look at. I think they passed the eye test as well, especially in that second half. They settled down some, and you got some really nice quarterback play. Again, I, I don't think that, unlike a lot of games last year, I don't think you can attribute this loss to the offensive line performance. Was it an active benefit for the Titans? No, I'd say it was pretty, like, it was It was serviceable. It was good. Maybe like a serviceable plus a good plus. Was it great? No. Was it bad? Absolutely not. I was impressed, especially with like you saw Peter Skaronsky really only make one big mistake, a rookie in his first game playing again, should be an easier position moving from tackle to interior offensive line, but playing left guard a position he has at no point in his football life played before. He only had one communication error and one, one sack allowed where he and Andre Dillard were not communicating well in, in um, sw switching off on a, I think it was a stunt that they, they, their responsibilities, they were on the same page and it allowed a free rusher to get to Tannehill. But beyond that, he was really, really good. And, and I've seen uh, uh, cut ups from folks on social media. I saw a number of times when I went back through the all 22 film and, and watched him in particular <clears throat> in the run blocking game. I mean, it was Pancake City. He was really, really effective as a run blocker. And I would say he was probably the best off or best offensive player for this team. He and Derrick Henry were 1A, 1B for this team, in my opinion, um, after rewatching that game. I was really impressed from what I saw from him. And then Chris Hubbard, man, this is maybe a sub take on is the offensive line fixed? Is Chris Hubbard good? If that's the take, I would say it's hot. I'd say it's like a, let's say it's an eight. Cause I, again, this is a 32 year old journeyman offensive lineman. There's a reason he was available when he was late into the summer. There's a reason that he's not being paid very much in terms of the tackle market. But in week one, dude was good. He looked good. 
he was really serviceable. I, I, uh, I'm going to pull up the stat here from our, our buddy, Justin Graver, but he was, I think the number one graded tackle in the league in a, in, oh, I don't want to say it wrong. Uh, offensive um, tackle pass block win rate win rankings. rate. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 The number one pass block win rate tackle from week one. I had tweeted uh, uh, it out saying this is the most surprising stat uh, Titan stat of the, of the week. Maybe the most surprising that we see in a while. The fact that Chris Hubbard, a journeyman 32 year old tackle that was brought in very late into the game to sub in after your starting right tackle gets suspended for gambling. He comes in as the number one graded pass block win rate tackle with 32 wins, or excuse me, 23 wins, a little dyslexia there, 23 wins on 23 plays, a 100% pass block win rate on a 31% double team rate. He was, dude was dealing out there. He was, he was pitching gas. Chris Hubbard, old man, still got it. I, he was above the likes of Jack Conklin, former Titan, Panay Sewell regarded as one of the best left tackles in the league. Abe Lucas, one of the best young tackles in the league in Seattle. Um, like he, he, he was dealing out there and I, I don't think anybody saw that coming. Certainly the, the bigger concern in terms of tackles was the left side and Andre Dillard. And, you know, in the grand scheme of things, maybe more concerning in that regard that the left side is your problem side. But if the veteran in they're both veterans, but the, um, I, I guess, I guess I should say the, the guy with, a higher expectation, maybe more, it's certainly more tools, better raw player in Andre Dillard is the one with the problem. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm trying to circle this square a little bit, square this circle, but it maybe is that, are you, are you happy today, JT? Maybe folks in the chat chime in on this. Are you happy today that Andre Dillard is the one you're more concerned about than Chris Hubbard? I, I kind of think that's a net positive. Well, Alex Titan says in the chat here, I thought Dillard looked underwhelming, but then I had Vietnam flashbacks of Dennis Daly and cracked a smile. I think everyone also Full blown did. PSD. Um, P PTSD. Yeah. It, I honestly think that, I mean, Chris, it, it's kind of a sigh of relief, I think, if anything. Like, okay, maybe this guy can be serviceable, and even if MPF comes back and is not mpf and it just doesn't look better okay chris hubbard still wheeling and dealing i think there is more concern though about andre dillard's play because of how streaky he was in the preseason and just like how it continues to look like if he starts off bad there's no way for him to recover in a game so right. like the the first like first or second series for that offensive line is probably the like andre dillard to watch him is probably the most important thing because that's how you know that's going to dictate how the left side of the line is going to go yeah. for that day. Um, so I think that's a little bit more concerning because of just like you gave him that contract and you're kind of expecting him to be a serviceable replacement above Dennis Daly. But like if being above Dennis Daly is still only like being below average, like it's still not great, you know? And that's what we talked about coming into the season, right? That no, no matter what you get from Andre Dillard, we don't know. Like the range of outcomes is pretty wide. It just, it law of averages, like just, it can't be as bad as what you had last year at left tackle. And through week one, I would say, yes, that holds, that holds water. That still holds up. Um, but, but again, better than horrible can be really, really bad. There, there are levels to this. So yeah, Chris Hubbard, good. Andre Dillard, underwhelming, but I don't think there's any reason for huge concern there. Uh, let's move on to the next take. Yeah. And before we move on real quick, just to give you some perspective on this Tennessee Titans line per PFF's premium stats, the, the Titans ranked fourth in the running in run blocking and they ranked 11th in pass blocking. So. Which that's maybe most surprising to me, JT, because we talked all summer about how this team was rebuilding their offensive line in the model of a run or excuse me, of a pass blocking offensive line. Like the MO on all of these new guys they brought in was that they are better pass blockers than they are run blockers. And so part of me, the back of my head was going into this season, going into this game thinking, well, the pass blocking may be greatly improved. They may have gone from worst in the league to league average, but it may, it may come at the expense Their You know, their run blocking may be really, really bad to start. And that it may kind of change the complexion of this team. They're still balling as run blockers. So like, that's still a thing. That's not a problem for them. And if they can do both of those things at like top 12 levels all season long, you're, I mean, you're in an amazing, amazing territory as compared to where you were last year. There's nothing you can complain about, about that, especially with a brand new group, kind of a ragtag 
uh, Island of Misfit Toys situation with a handful of these guys that come in and, and they immediately work well together. Again, can't overreact positively or negatively to one week. They could be a, a five alarm flaming dumpster fire disaster in just a couple of days at Nissan Stadium. We'll have to see. But against a good Saints team, a good Saints pass rush, they held their own. All right, let's speed up these Titans ones because we have a lot of takes to get. Here I know, I know. And I, here. I, um, to be fair, with some of these later takes, I, I'm gonna. I've just got like a thought or two on them. These Titans okay. ones, I really want to give give the Titans right, fans yeah. their due on on of these. Course. But yeah, uh, the next one here, it's the same old Titans. Titan Tim coming mm. back. Oh, it's the same I, old uh, Titans. That gummit Titan. Yeah, yeah, I, wait, this is what happens when you draft Will Levis and not a ball boy. Like we heard all Hooker. summer long that this team is gonna look all different, all sorts of different, all this mess, and then what we got, we got the same old. Titans week one that gummit that's I mean it's a lot of what you heard I saw even Mike Herndon who we love friend of the show friend of mine saying that like oh, the Titans don't look all that different after week one I I couldn't disagree with that more and I alluded to this a little bit on Monday but I wanted to hammer the the point home here and if you're saying same old Titans in the sense that they like it was kind of chaos and you were nervous the whole time and then they lost a close game I get I get the general sentiment to be like oh same old Titans sure whatever but in terms of things that fans were asking for, the past, at least last season, but the, I'd say the at least in the Todd Downing era and in the last couple of seasons, what were things you wanted to see from this team? God, we got to have more creativity offensively. Dude, you got it in week one. Tim Kelly was, was doing what you were asking of him as a creative, different play caller. You could argue that he got a little too creative at times. So, like, I you got the creativity. It was not mundane. How many times in this game did you see people being like, oh, there we go, run, run, pass. Like, at first and second down, we're running the ball. It's so predictable. You didn't see that. that. That wasn't a thing. There were times they were going empty on first down, on second and long. Like, this was something that we saw from the Titans that people were asking for already. What else? We, we, we've seen people asking for a pass heavier offense. You got it. It was a lot of interceptions. So like, you know, maybe a careful what you wish for situation there, but you got it. This team passed the ball a good deal. It was not a crazy run heavy offensive game plan. That's not what happened out there on the field. Um, your offensive skill players were not just healthy and on the field. That's, you know, that's a big one right there, but they were getting open. They were playing well. Again, DeAndre Hopkins played a fine game. Jalen Burks and Chigakonkwa, especially if you go back and rewatch or you watch the, the coaching film, they were getting open. They were playing well. You know, the, the, uh, Ty J Spears out snapping Derrick Henry, freaking people out in that regard. I, I think that's an outlier situation. I'm not too concerned about that in particular, but a, a big feature part of this offense already and playing well, getting open, having a walk-in touchdown. That if there's a better pass, he would have had a walk-in touchdown. A nice run to the the left side, getting around the edge and showing off that speed, being a really nice, refreshing one-two punch to Derrick Henry's thunder and being that lightning this team needed out of the backfield. And then defensively, it wasn't a, a change, but you, why would you want one? This Titans defense has been really good. Um, maybe I'd say the number one thing you can talk about is the secondary is same old Titans. And we're going to talk about that take next. Um, but yeah, that's really the only thing where it feels like the same old, Hey, special teams, Craig Ackerman for as much crap we, as we give him and he deserves all of it. Truly this week. He doesn't this week. I thought special outside of the, the blocked punt where that's just a, a missed assignment. It, it, it's that's a bad play. They, they, they played well. I thought the special teams were perfectly fine. I have no notes for Greg Ackerman besides let's, you know, not get punts blocked. It's, it's kind of, I think blocked punts are more of like, if, if you're getting a blocked punt every week, then we can talk about it, but that feels like more of a, a fluke thing than anything. So again, I, I think that actually the only thing you should really be mad about same old Titans is Ryan Tannehill threw three interceptions. Like every, like you got a lot of change and you lost the game because Ryan Tannehill threw three interceptions. It's, I think it's really that simple, but I think it's reductive and wrong and dumb to say it's the same old Titans. I give it, I give it a 10 out of 10 on the on the heat index truly because i think it's i think it's dumb and it's wrong um it, it is a, the combo of factually incorrect and unappreciative of you you've got a lot of what you asked for you just you had a frustrating game because your quarterback couldn't protect the ball yeah and we can move on here this is kind of we'll do this one in kind of a two-parter because it lends itself yeah um the secondary still stinks mm -hmm. and furthermore i'm fully out on christian fulton yeah, I saw so takes. many people say just I'm out on Fulton. I'm out, I'm I'm done. I give up. And fair, right? Like I 
I get it. He, a guy that he had a promising preseason, promising offseason situation, contract year, a lot of reports about, oh, the dude's dealing out there. He's pitching gas in, in training camp and in practice. He looks like a star corner. And then 10 seconds into the season, he goes down and misses a large chunk of the game. Uh, for that take, I'm out on Christian Fulton. I give it a two. It's not a hot take. I think most people are feeling that way on him after that first game. Uh, I, I, I'd, I'd say it's unfair because it's been one game. But I don't, you know, is it is it an overreaction? Yes. But do I get it? I super get it. I really do. Um, and if it proves to not be an overreaction, just to be, you know, I wasn't wrong. I was just early. Maybe that's how this take turns out for most people. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. So, yeah, definitely red flagging that situation. And then the secondary still stinks. I give it a four. Like, I think I think people are giving maybe the secondary too much credit for this game. Like we mentioned on Monday. I think it was 305 of the Saints 350 some odd total yards on Sunday in that game came through the air. It was, I, th I think the Titans had an 100 yard rusher in something like seven or eight straight games. They allowed 50 some odd rushing yards, maybe less than that to the, the Saints. And that run defense is still really stout. The pass rush is still really fierce. It's the secondary that's still the odd man out. I thought they were sneaky bad upon rewatch. I thought it was kind of sneaky bad communication assignments, playing your position properly and picking up switches, um, play, playing your zone wisely and not biting too hard on one guy. Like there were a lot of pretty elementary things on the film where you're like that. These are things that are kind of, they feel like rust maybe, but you got to get those ironed out. You got to get them ironed out soon. I, I think that the secondary was sneaky bad on Sunday and against a, you know, a, one of the best quarterbacks in the league for my money, Justin Herbert with some weapons, LA coming down, you, you got to clean that up. Justin Herbert is a couple of steps above Derek Carr in terms of a passing threat. You got to be way better this week. Yeah. And then we can move on here to our final Titans one. And you touched on it a little bit, but uh, the take that Tim Kelly was a problem on Sunday. Yeah. I touched on this a bit, but I, I thought that Tim Kelly was great. I give this a, a nine out of 10 on the hot read heat index. I think it's a hot take. I think it's a bad take. Tim Kelly, again, he was, he's, People were super mad about Ryan Tannehill not just throwing interceptions, but there were two plays in particular, the trick play that schemed open Chig, and then the Tajay out of the backfield play that schemed him open for a walk-in touchdown. He schemed two touchdown looks, at least. He also schemed Chig Okonkwo wide open, deep, deep down the field on that Chris Moore interception where Tannehill makes the wrong read and misses Chig just underneath Chris Moore for a massive gain to inside the 15-yard line. He schemed open so many looks. There were three or four different plays where Traylon Brooks is, there's one in particular, Traylon Brooks running up the left side of the field with his hand up. Hey, I'm open. Throw it to me. No one's on me. Tannehill misses it. He was scheming dudes open. He was being creative. He wasn't being reductive or predictable or way too run heavy. He arguably went away from Derrick Henry too much. I think that's the biggest critique is that you need to rely on your best playmaker in Derrick Henry a little bit more. Maybe you were overdoing the creativity, but I understand where you're coming from. Like Tim Kelly was pitching gas in that game and Ryan Tannehill couldn't execute. I think the take is crazy that Tim Kelly was a problem. I saw one, I think it's a Texas fan be like, well, I told you Titans fans. I told you when they hired him. When they hired Tim Kelly in the spring, dude can't call red zone offense. In the red zone, again, it, it was procedural issues. It was execution issues. Did we see this team take a step back in terms of the red zone efficiency based on historical precedent? Yes, they, they've been a team the past couple of seasons that when they get into the red zone, it's an automatic seven points. They're great in the red area. On Sunday, they went over two, over three, whatever it was. They didn't get into the end zone once. They had field goals. They got stopped. But, but watching it back, looking at the play calls there, there were only a, two or three times in the red zone where I thought, eh, I don't I don't love that play call there. Don't love that decision. Not the order of operations that I would personally go with. But on the whole, didn't have a problem with it. So I, I think that this is crazy. Tim Kelly was not a problem on Sunday. And that's going to wrap up our Titans takes here. Before we yeah. move on, let's see if anybody had some Titans specific ones in okay. in the uh, chat here. And Logan Grady comes in with one where he says, take Titans should only play people who are missing a ligament or tendon Spears and Rogers tandem. <laughs> yeah, no um, bad take. I give it a 10. Um, I'd give it a, a 10 on, on humor. He's clever. Um, but, but no, I, I think that, um, one of those things is a good idea, but one of those things is very bad old man Rogers with no Achilles I'll pass. And then finally, Alex Titan says, due to how easy the back half of the schedule is Tannehill won't be benched until they are mathematically eliminated. 
Yeah, good take. I mean, it's hot because people right now think that he's going to be on a short leash. Uh, so like an eight on the hot read heat index, but a good eight. I mean, I'm with you on that take. I don't know why it's a hot take. I think it should be a cold take. It should be a popular take, but it is hot. People just haven't realized yet that this guy's going to be your starter. Like it's it's just the way that it is, whether you like it or not. All right, we can move on to the AFC South here, starting with. Uh, the Jaguars, in which Trevor Lawrence is a top 10 quarterback in the league. Yeah, man, he is. And I, I kind of have been saying this to Titans fans since the end of last year. Go watch that. Like, I, I implore you before you have a like, Trevor Lawrence, didn't prove nothing yet. Like, first of all, quarterback, you know, wins are not a quarterback stat. So, like, past success in terms of wins and losses, you can't really, like, he's a big player there, but that's not really 100% reflective on him go watch the plays he made in week one on Sunday against the Indianapolis Colts in Indianapolis. He had some bonkers passes. I had, I mean, moving, uh, throwing across his body uh, into crazy tight windows, making some plays that you're like, that's the kind of thing that you see Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert do freaky, freaky stuff. He, in my opinion, is a top five passing talent in the league already um, has been since the back half of last season. And just as a quarterback as a whole, his all his all around well roundedness, I think he's a stud, man. I think he's a top ten passer in the league already. If you don't think I'm, you think I'm crazy now. I, I'm. I would bet money that by the end of the year you'll begrudgingly agree. You'll finally come around on it. I, I get it. You're maybe a little hard headed on it. Whatever. You're gonna you're gonna be forced to admit it. Dude's good. Dude can ball. Sunshine is is good at football. Like he's just he's just really really good. And if you can't get after him, your pass rush and or cover his receivers that pretty good Christian Kirk, Calvin Ridley, Evan Ingram dudes were cooking some, I mean like the Colts backfield, their DBs very concerning this year. So like, I don't think that's super reflective, but they were cooking some dudes and getting open a couple of times, like open, open, like college open was kind of gross at times that that kind of thing is going to happen against you. If, if you, if you can't cover those guys and or get after Trevor Lawrence, it's going to be a long day for you defensively when you, when you face the Jaguars. And then to that extent, with Trevor Lawrence being uh, that that top 10 quarterback, like you said, the Jaguars are clearly the best team in the AFC South. Yeah, now you have to punt the brakes. Now you have to punt the brakes. The Jaguars are not yet clearly the best team in the AFC South. They give this a 7.5 on the hot rate, hot read heat index scale. Um, listen, he he's – they, rather. The, the Jaguars are a very good offense, and I think what – Trevor Lawrence and those weapons in Doug Peterson are going to be able to do this year. They're going to be in shootouts all year long. They're going to be running up the score all year, all year long. But part of the reason they're going to have to be in shootouts all year long is because that defense is not good. It's not good. The pass rush is, is really lacking in their secondary. The spine of that defense has some serious holes. They got a, a guy or two on the outside at cornerback that are <clears throat> perfectly good at their job. Um, but, but on the whole, the, the depth that there is concerning and I don't love what they have at safety. Their linebackers are just fine. They young with potential. So I'm not writing them off yet, but very much green and inexperience. In and I don't trust them yet. And again, their pass rush, it's Josh Allen and a bunch of, oh, you better hope Trayvon Walker works out. Maybe he does. He's a first overall pick. He's got the talent to do so, but so far it's not been great. What I've seen from him. I wasn't crazy impressed in week one, thought he was good. But if he can, you know, if, if he's trending this way based on week one, I'd say he'll be a serviceable guy, maybe not living up to that first overall pick title. But yeah, on the whole, that defense is going to force them into a lot of a lot of shootouts this year. They are not yet the best team in the AFC South. They just played the Colts with the quarter, a rookie quarterback who has what 13 career starts since coming to college. He's very young. He's very raw. That team is missing maybe their best playmaker on offense and Jonathan Taylor. Like there's a thousand reasons why they should have won that game. They did win that game. Let's see them play the chiefs this week. I think it may be um, really revealing one way or another, what this team is really made of when they go up against that chiefs team in week two. And then our final AFC South one, before we get to the comments here, uh, the Texans defense is good. Yes. Good take. I think it's hot because people aren't coming around to it yet. I'll give it like a six and a half, seven on the hot read heat index, but it's a good six or seven. It's the correct take. I wholeheartedly believe this take. I am I am claiming this take as my own. I was saying before the season that this, I mean, I think one of my take purge takes was that the Texans would be a top 10 defense this year. If it wasn't, it was on my short list of things to talk about. 
they're good, man. Go watch that game against Baltimore. They held a Ravens offense that is new but has some serious talent. They held them in check all game long. They kept that offense, the, the Texans offense, which is limited, low ceiling in my opinion, a lot of moving, new moving pieces, and a rookie quarterback. There's a lot there that needs help. And the defense, they did the helping. I thought that they were really, really tight. I thought they showed a lot of promise. That pass rush, Will Anderson looked as billed as a, as a as a uh, an NFL prospect coming out this year. I, I liked a lot of what I saw in that game, and I think that their defense is just going to get nastier as the season goes. Yeah, and then we can get to the comments here where Logan Grady said, to your point about Lawrence, he says, however, Lawrence makes too many bad throws. Colts dropped two picks, and his wide receivers made some great plays. I will say his wide receivers really bailed him out this week, but – I mean, every quarterback's going to have a couple bad throws and they're like, it's just, it's just how it is. You know, have you seen Josh Allen play football? Like, I don't think anybody's disagreeing that Josh Allen is one of the best passers in the league. He also makes some hair, hair ball decisions. Did you watch Josh Allen play football in his third year? He made even more hair, hair brained decisions. Like Trevor Lawrence is still learning. He's still developing, he, developing. He is not at the peak of his powers, which is what should scare you because he's already very, very good. And when he's not making bad throws, he's making flamethrower passes that just you're getting torched. There's nothing you can do. It is, it is, it is earth bending stuff. Like you don't stand a chance. He has those throws for every bad throw he has. He has a game breaking throw in these games that he's played the past six or seven games in a row. Dude can ball. Dude is good. I, 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 I agree that he makes some, some bad passes, but it's, it's not the bad passes I'm, I'm worried about. It's the crazy game breaking passes. And again, they're pretty one for one right now. And then Dorito lover comes in here and says, Calvin Ridley is by far the best receiver in this division. Yeah, I give that a, I give it a, I give it a six on the hot read hit index. I, I don't agree that he's by far. Is he the best receiver in the division? I think so. Yeah. I, I, I love Calvin Ridley. I love him watching him as a player. He's a stud. I would, I would not argue that he is the best receiver in the division, but I do think that Deandre Hopkins and Traylon Burks are a somewhat close to three. Deandre had, I think what do you have 12 catches on 15 targets or something like that in this week's game or uh, what, double digit, targets and he had double digit target he had 13 targets i don't know how many catches eight or nine something like that yeah. but um he he was the volume king that he's been he was a walking talking third down conversion if only you could hit him um deandre hopkins still has the goods we know this and then Traylon burks i can't like what he did in this game there was that burst of three burks targets in a row in the game and then you didn't see him the rest of the time Watching the coaching tape, it was really, really encouraging. Like, dude was getting open. Dude, like, he just, he, his lack of involvement in that game was not reflective on the, the game that he had, is what I will say. Um, I think Traylon Brooks is, is, I still have faith in him proving himself one of the best receivers in the AFC South. So, by far, is, is a one step too far for me. But yeah, Kellen really is the best guy in this division. And then finally, Logan says the Titans will be the only AFC South team above 500 by the Ah, end of the season, I'm assuming. Yeah, no, I'm I'm out on this. I give it I give it an eight. I mean, would it be crazy? No. Can I see it happening? Sure. Do I think it will happen? I really don't. The the schedules for the Titans and the Jaguars simply have too many winnable games on them. The Jaguars have a, a too good of a coach quarterback weapons combo on offense to not win a lot of games. I think that both teams will win at least nine games, and um, I, I don't see this being accurate. All right, and then we can move on to some league-wide overreactions before we wrap up here, starting with uh, someone out in the uh, West Coast. That, that I don't know why that took me so long to figure out where they are located, but it has to do with the Los Angeles Rams. That and is Matt where they Stafford are. Stafford yes. and the Rams are back, baby. And He's back, baby. Did you watch any of that game, Matt Stafford? Still got it. Dealing to Puka Nakua, 15 targets. Target King, well, I think he and Tyreek Hill were the leaders in uh, target share. I think that I saw somebody, the advanced stats, Puka Nakua was the first read option on Sunday. A, a white hot, blindingly ridiculous 41% of the uh, the past attempts that Matt Stafford made. Puka Nakua is the truth, man. And shout out Stoney Keeley. Shout out Zach Lyons. Shout out you and I, whoever was big on Puka in in the draft process he's the truth i love that he's balling helps the cooper cup's not around like that cooper, cooper cup, cup does come back baby. that will change unfortunately yeah P- puka cup um 
but but dude was just was balling and his quarterback was balling. It looked like old school, old school Stafford wheeling and dealing. All of that being said, I think that it's one of the more um more uh, every week one has a couple mirage games. I think that that's one of the mirage games. Um, I just, I, the, the Seahawks are not that bad. I still have faith in them to be a playoff team. I still have faith in them to win that division. I'm not giving up on that take after one week. And I don't think the Rams are going to be that good. There's too many holes. I want to see them play a really, really good team and see how they fare. I think that, I think they play the 49ers this week. They so do. let's see if they listen, if they play like they did against the Seahawks, against the 49ers and win that game or lose close, then maybe I'm willing to buy into it. But I, I think that game was a bit of a mirage. I'll give that. You know, them being back, I'd say it's like an eight and a half, nine on the hot read heat index. It's a hot take. We can move on to the Buffalo Bills. Josh Allen and the Bills have serious issues. How hot is that take? Oh, boy. That game last night was tough, tough for Bills fans everywhere. Great for Jets fans. Glad that I mean, relish it, Jets fans. Maybe that I would imagine it's the highest point that you'll have emotionally all season at this point. But yeah. Josh Allen and the Bills have serious issues. I'm gonna I, I still there's they are my Super Bowl pick this year. And on one hand, I will we've got a really good Bills friend, you and I, JT. Our buddy Sean is a huge Bills fan. And last year, you know, they have the the season opener on Thursday night. They play the defending Super Bowl champion Rams, absolutely mollywop them, just bury them in the ground, like you know, 40 to 10 game or whatever it was, killed them. It in, in glorious fashion, too ton of fireworks from Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs, they were balling. And I told him last year, half jokingly, but half seriously, like, oh no, this is bad news. Like your team, like they've peaked too early. There's always a team every single year, at least one team that is just lights out golden, brilliant chef's kiss in September and October. And you can't burn that bright for five months in a row. You simply can't. It's the NFL. you got to peak at the right time. And so if you're peaking early, like it may spell, um, a come down at the wrong time at the end of the year. And with the bills, we kind of saw that. And so I told him last night, like, Hey, chin up King. You, this is what you want. You want to struggle in September and October. Well, I mean, like you think back the easiest example is bill Belichick. And I, I would argue Andy Reid as well. Those two coaches who for the past, I don't know, two decades have been really, really good at the right time in the NFL. Most every year, they are notorious for having really suspect September's and October's. And every year it'd be like, Oh, fine. This is finally the year. The Patriot, the NFL has figured out the Patriots, man. Dynasty, big roadblock in the dynasty. They are, they are five. Oh, they're five. They've lost three games in their first eight games. You know, they're four and four. And then they tear off 13 in a row and win the Super Bowl. Like this is the time of year when coaches are tinkering. This is the time of year when coaches are figuring out what they want to look like. Um, you, you're trying to win games, obviously, no doubt about that, but you're definitely like, this is the time of year where you're trying to get right for November and December and January. And so like good news bills, you, you struggle early. You got to face some adversity. Every team has to face adversity at some point. If you face no adversity, you, you get the, the 16 and 0 Patriots, like you, you face no adversity. You're not going to get to the finish line. You have to be able to, if you don't have that mental grit, the, the ability to bounce back as a team. You ain't making it to the finish line. Um, and so um, in that regard, Good, good for you, Bills. However, Josh Allen in particular last night lost in that game. Four turnovers, three interceptions, and a fumble to to ice that cake. I, my issue with him right now, JT, and maybe you have thoughts on this. I feel like at this point his reckless play style is a choice. We saw early in his career, very raw, very very unpolished product. His reckless play style coming out of college was just it was the way that he was. It's the way he knew how to play ball. And I didn't really blame him for the way that I felt like he just was. And then we saw in the past couple of years, he's ascended to a top three, top two quarterback in the league. He started to play within structure. He started to play more disciplined. He started to play more like a veteran. He started to take that next step or two or three and play within the structure, the way that you're supposed to and make good decisions and be a top quarterback in the league. But you still get these glimpses of just, you know, the meme where it's like, it's Josh Allen time, quote, assigned to Josh Allen. Like that's what you get a lot in these games. And I feel like his watch me throw this ball over those mountains mentality is a choice at this point I, because I've seen him not do it. I've seen him choose not to do it. And then he just, he still comes out and he does it. And that's, that's hurting this team. He it's his blessing and his curse that Josh Allen has never played a snap of football where he was not playing. Like it was a playoff game, two minute drill last play of the game. And they're down six. Like, 
That's what makes him awesome and electric and the fireworks and all of these brilliant, gorgeous things and makes him a game breaker when he's on. But when he's off, it's ugly. And I think I think that he has to be better mentally at making that choice to play within structure better. Play the way that the te- the rest of the team is is scheming things up and designing things to be. Um, and he's just he's making bad decisions. He's making dumb decisions. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, if you're if you're the if you're the GM of the Bills, you have to be just kind of like, you know, just gasping and holding your breath every single time that Josh Allen like tucks the ball. I feel like, especially given that Aaron Rodgers like ten seconds before blew out his Achilles last night, like just seeing Josh Allen run like that on that field, like would definitely scare me a little bit. And then also like just some of the plays he was making, as you said, like there was no reason for him to throw up that basically just punt the ball down the field on that first interception. He had a running lane to get to that first down. Like his decision-making is definitely hero ball. And that's what he's always been defined as. Um, Next team here, who may also be defined by hero ball a lot of the time, Joe Burrow and the Bengals have serious issues as well. Yeah, I I, I don't find this one that upsetting. And JT, you'll have a lot of insight on this as a Bengals fan. You know, he, this is what the f- third, fourth consecutive offseason where Joe Burrow has, for some reason, usually medically not had time in the preseason to gel with his teammates. Um, I think he just started practicing the week before week one or the two weeks before week one after taking pretty much a month off with that, that lower body soft tissue injury. I forget the exact nature of it, but, um, I, I just, I think that they start slow and because of, of that and, and the fact that this team has historically started slow, I'm not too concerned about it. They also always just have, it's like every team has their Achilles heel team. And for the Bengals, it's the Browns. They just always play the Browns weird. I'm not that thrown off by that game. I think they'll bounce back. I give that like a, I give that like a two on the heat index. I would agree too. I I think maybe Zach Taylor has some serious issues. I've kind of come back down to earth on Zach Taylor as a quarter, as a head coach. Um, But if anybody on that team has issues, it's Zach Taylor, but I, I I don't, I don't have any problems with this team. I think they're going to just get back right back on track looking this week, another divisional game against the Baltimore Ravens. So that'll be interesting. Right. The team that you might have already alluded to this, but a team that is starting off red hot and looks to keep it going. The Dolphins are Super Bowl contenders this season. If Tua stays healthy, I give this like a, a two or three on the heat index. I think I think that they are. I mean, our buddy Mike McDaniel pitching gas in that game. They had they had I, I think that they over doubled the the second highest explosive play number in they had 18 explosive plays, which is 20 plus yards gained in that game against the chargers 18. I mean, like when you have like nine in a week, you're balling. Like that's a great week. We had nine explosive plays. They had 18 of those plays where they gained 20 or more yards. Ridiculous fireworks, boom, explosions everywhere. Like it was Armageddon out there. Um, I think that this offense is awesome. I think the defense is legit. It's really that simple. I think the dolphins, as long as Tua stays healthy, and to a place the way that he did on on week one, which again, week one's a liar. Maybe maybe that was an outlier performance for him. But if that, if he looks anything like that, I, I think that he could work and they could be serious contenders in the AFC. Yeah, moving on here now, the Jets are dead with Zach Wilson as quarterback. Uh, Yeah, I think they are. I mean, like, I don't think this is hot. I think this is a one on the heat index. Tell me why they aren't. Zach Wilson, like we know what he is at this point. It'd be kind of funny if he had this miraculous step up and play now that he has to like, like that'd be good for jets fans and, and be a cool story for sure. But who's expecting that to actually happen. This team knows they're dead without, without um, Aaron Rodgers, in particular with Zach Wilson. He's just not got the goods. This defense is unfortunately too good to squander. So they're going to have to scramble to find some solution, but they're dead in the water with Zach Wilson. Next up here, Baker Mayfield and the Buccaneers get a surprise win against the Minnesota Vikings this past week. This this quarterback and team tandem will work. I kind of think this is one of the mirage games of week one. I'm going to give it like a seven on the hot read heat index. I think the Baker's going to ball. And you're going to see the good and the bad of Baker. Another guy that we know who Baker is. We know what he is at this point. He's going to have games like that where with that really nice wide receiver tandem of Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, assuming they're healthy and out there, he's going to have opportunities and open receivers and he's going to make some plays and be a gamer. But there's a really 
dark side to his gamer abilities, gamer mentality, where I don't think that I, I don't think that it's going to work some weeks and it's going to be a disaster some weeks. And you're going to have like, like you saw from Ryan Tannehill this weekend, you may have a couple of those games from Baker this year, like his one touchdown, three interception games. Um, is he going to be like good? No week one. Like, I think that may be the best performance of their season, but will they be like the worst team in the league challenge the Cardinals for worst record? I don't think so. I think their ceilings too. High. I think the defense too good. I think the ceiling on the offense is too high. I think they'll win like five or six games at least. And then finally here, Jordan Love and the Packers are legit. That is definitely a mirage game for me. And I, I like what the Packers did. I believe in what the Packers did. And I'm not saying they aren't I legit, too. but I don't think Jordan Love is as nearly as good as what he looked like in that game. I, I think that that like I, I think the Bears defense is sneaky horrendous. I don't know why people think the Bears are going to be back on offense. Like there's a lot to, you know, I guess theoretically to be happy about, but <laughs> On, on defense, they're, they're a disaster. That's a really bad defense. And I think that they made the Packers look really, really, really good in that game. Now, credit to to um, Mike LaFleur, or not Mike, Matt LaFleur. Yeah, Matt LaFleur is up there in Green Bay. Um, and and he, you know, has, has been a guy that has sort of tangentially been in the coach of the year conversation the past couple seasons, but it's always been, oh, Aaron, he's got Aaron Rodgers. He's got the two-time MVP there. He's winning MVPs. We can't give the, the coach of the year to the same team. Like it's, it's, what is it? Is it the coach or is it the quarterback? We chose the quarterback. Well, this is his season to prove like, Hey guys, it was me. Like I, me too. Like I was balling and, and I was pitching gas and, and that's what he did in week one. So credit to him. I'm excited to watch him call plays and coach this team this year but I don't think they're as good as they are. So are they legit? Yes, th that's not a hot take, but are they as good as they looked in week one? That was kind of miragey. And that's going to do it for our heat index for today. All right, that is the hot read heat index overreaction week one edition. Loved that, ton of fun. Almost done with the day. We've got one more segment for you. The news with producer JT, some things to talk about before we leave. So without further ado, let's get into the news with producer JT. Yeah, and only two things to go over here today. Not a lot of news after just only one day since week one here. But the Titans, after week one, their offense, we'll just do some rankings here for perspective. Uh, their offense was 16th in the passing game, uh, 13th in the rushing game, and then um, tied also 30th uh, for third down percentage, 26th Ugh. for points. Um, and then on the defense, they were 25th overall with a fifth best rushing defense, 28th best pass defense, and a 23rd best third down defense. Uh, once again, eighth for tied for points, totally scored in that game. So some good uh, being the defensive line, really good, some pretty average, the offense, and then some bad on the third down offense and uh, the defensive secondary. Yeah, you want to talk same old Titans. That was, I mean, that's what you saw last year, right? You saw a ton of, of weeks where it was, where they were the tie or a top five run defense and a bottom five pass defense. That's what they were this past week. That's what I'm afraid they're going to be. I think this secondary has a ceiling that's higher than last year's. And if they can stay healthy and gel and get better, Chris Harris, I trust him as the coach of that secondary group. They can be much better than they were. But as of now, they're no good. And they are really holding back that defense from truly being an elite unit in the NFL. The front is elite. The run defense is elite, but the pass defense is a serious problem right now. Yeah. And then finally, one note to keep an eye on as we get into practice this week, Austin Eckler is dealing with a little bit of an ankle injury and yeah, uh, his timeline this week may be a little questionable, something to look at for this week as the chargers might be without their dynamic running back. Yeah, big deal. Um, big deal and little deal, right? Big deal in the sense that he's a dynamic playmaker. That we're going to talk a lot about some of the numbers from the Chargers Week One on the Thursday live show, live from Boomba's in Spring Hill. But without giving any of that away, really diving into the Titans Chargers matchup, they had one of this is not hyperbole, statistically one of the best running games in the history of the league in the modern era on Week One against the against the Dolphins. They were really incredible running the ball. And a big part of that is Austin Eckler. And without him, that's not possible. That's the big part of it. The, the smaller part of it, the, the glass half empty element is, well, okay, but this Titans run defense is like, that's not the concern. It, the run defense was going to handle them. That wasn't going to be a big issue. It's the pass defense we're concerned about. So kind of two ways to look at that. But overall, it's like the Saints not having Kamara. 
it's a big impact on the offense overall, both in the running and in the passing game. And just the, the, the number, the number of mouths they can feed, the number of changeups they can throw at you. Losing Austin Eckler is losing one of those, and that's a big deal for the Titans trying to defend a pretty good Chargers team. And that's going to do it for our news today. All right. Thank you, JT. That is the news with JT. And that is our show today. Went a little long, but had a lot of fun talking through the Hot Read Heat Index. A couple things before you go. Make sure you subscribe again to the Broadway Sports Media's YouTube page. Hit that subscribe button. It's free. It helps us. It's easy for you to do. Just hit subscribe. Broadway Sports Media on YouTube. Give us a subscription. We're trying to get those numbers up. Make sure you follow, subscribe, rate, review, all those good things wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, whatever. Uh, you know where to get your podcasts. Make sure you subscribe to the Hot Read Podcast there. And make sure you're following us on social media at Hot Read Pod on Twitter, on TikTok, on Instagram. That's at Hot Read Pod for show content and updates. And when we're going live like we are here today. That is it from us. For producer JT, I'm your host, Easton Freeze. We'll be back live on Thursday from Boom Boss Pizza in Spring Hill. Come out, hang with us, watch Thursday Night Football, have a good time. Recording the live show Thursday for our Friday morning release. Until then, this has been the Hot Read Podcast. We will talk to you on Thursday.